I was at a so uh, really, really want to thank everybody for coming to the second in our summer webinar series. And really, we are truly sorry to interrupt your summer holidays. And we're just thrilled with how many people actually will take a uh, side turn from their holidays because these are important issues. This is the second in our uh, summer series on the webinars and really thankful, as Bill will introduce later, our um, panelists in terms of how do we engage the political parties and how do we make sure that uh, the policymakers are aware of certainly what the needs are, not just of the rare diseases, but all the patient communities, as we are sure they are. So we're really delighted to have our, our esteemed panelists with us, and as I say, Bill will introduce later. Just a very quick introduction in terms of the topics um, before we get going there. Uh, as we said here, there are sort of four big issues that we've got here, um, and we do encourage you to, as we go through, to put your comments into the chat line because we want to have a bit of a dialogue with the um, with the political folks that we have online. So this is a great opportunity to raise your issues and questions to them, and hopefully, you know, they can be on their toes to respond to you as well. Um, and we also really encourage you to. Um, to be available as we're going to do a debrief on it um, toward the last 20 minutes or so of the webinar. But this is really opportune for us because um, actually we weren't anticipating you know, some of the issues that are here. We were anticipating that we will have Health Canada's What We Heard report on building a national strategy for drugs for rare diseases. And I won't go into big details. Hopefully everybody on has had the opportunity to download it, to take a look at it. And uh, we will in fact, um, you know, kind of do some deeper dives in terms of what the different elements of it are. But I will have to say from court's perspective, we were truly pleased that what they reported back they heard is pretty much what we said. And I will do a huge shout out to all of our participants because a lot of you were the ones that responded. They said 650 or so individual and group respondents, but a lot of patient organizations, a lot of other stakeholder organizations, and a lot of those messages as they echoed in terms of the top lines were exactly what we've been talking about. We need to have a national program that we need to deal with fairness and equity. We need to make sure that it is you know, transparent and that there is, in fact, the, the high level of engagement. I think we also need to make sure that, you know, front and center is that um, access is not just dependent on uh, not only where you live, but the fact is that we want to have evidence-based medicines and that getting access to those medicines, even the expensive medicines, has got to be uh, done in a way that's going to be, as they said as well, affordable, accessible, and sustainable. So we're very, I think, excited about the fact that it's opened up some opportunities and we will again, hopefully, be able to hear some feedback from our political uh, commentaries, uh, commentators as we go on. Um, the second issue, and I think Bill can go into better, that we are really concerned because this is one of the purposes that we had originally said is that the PMPRB popped up with a, uh, a new set of guidelines that they want to have implemented in the short term. They pulled back on the ability to implement the guidelines in June until January, citing a lot of uh, concerns around timing. And instead, they popped up with a new one. And honestly, I do call it a whack-a-mole strategy. So this does not give us some strong sense of confidence in terms of what is being proposed in terms of assuring we have accessible, uh, uh, accessible, sustainable uh, a, a drug program. And of course, we do have, not surprisingly, a, a fall election that's going to be coming up. I don't know. I don't know if any of our political commentators are going to tell me otherwise. And, but. Um, I think we are pretty much lining up for that. So we're very excited about that. And certainly um, we have saw, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Many of you have seen that um, Health Canada asked CADAS to put together an advisory panel for pan-Canadian prescription drug lists. And we want to make sure that there is going to be, you know, the, you know, never mind our, you know, thinking about a, a drug list to begin with, but we want to make sure that there is in fact rare diseases in there. So we'll come back to that in terms of what we might do afterwards. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to turn it over to Bill, who's going to help us, you know, um, who's going to uh, facilitate with us the discussion with the, um, with the panelists and uh, have them introduce kind of themselves and, and kind of where they're starting from. Excellent. Thanks so much, Durhan. And just to, um, Complement two things on the on the four big issues to up, for update. Um, first of all, on the PMPRB, uh, just came out this morning. The timeline for input on this latest consultation has been extended by a couple of weeks, which is 
really welcome. Um, and they've just tweeted that they're, they're, they are gonna issue a Q and A document to explain, uh, because as I've joked with some people, trying to figure out what their latest proposal was required an orphan Annie decoder ring. Um, you're looking through multiple documents and having to, to overlay them. Um, and so it'll be really interesting to see uh, you know, how that's explained. And I think that will give people a little bit more time to, uh, to be able to weigh in. And then the other, other thing, it's, it's on the slide in terms of the Health Canada's What We Heard report. Um, I think that we're going to have a lot more conversations uh, about this, of course, um, in the coming weeks and, and months. Um, it's, it's now a national strategy for drugs for rare diseases. It's not just uh, a national strategy for high cost drugs for rare diseases. I think that that's a really important nuance that they actually pulled that out. And um, it recognizes that, you know, it's not just about high cost drugs. Um, there, there, there are a lot of medicines out there that can actually help people. And, and that, as they heard, um, that puts a bit of a scarlet letter on uh, rare disease patients. I think there was even uh, some, some um, uh, guilt and worry about stigma, et cetera, about, about, about uh, being a rare disease patient, patient and, and costing the system a lot of money. And that was heard. And then I, I think, Jurhan, as you were, you were saying, it's not just about the rare disease drug strategy, it's how does this fit into and complement and actually um, you know, bring to action a rare disease strategy. And there were some really neat elements in that what we heard report. It's about diagnosis, it's about uh, research, it's about centers of excellence. How do we make sure that they really fit together? So um, I think that that's, that's enough of a quick update. I think for the, for the delegates on the line, we can come back to these issues at the end. Um, we had a great session last week, as many of you know, uh, looking at the, the, the long list of, of issues and, and uh, things that, that CORD and citizens and, and all of the different groups on the line want to bring forward um, for, for policy change um, at the federal level. Um, the challenge, and I should say at the national level, uh, the challenge we, we discovered and talked through last week is how to actually translate you know, those nitty gritty policy issues into something that, that can turn into a political promise. And, you know, especially on the, the opportunity that, that presents itself next year. Um, the last election in 2019, uh, two of the, of the major political parties promised $500 million a year annually for rare starting in on April 1st, uh, 2022. Uh, that uh, we think, we, we know, remains and has been recommitted to by at least the Liberals. Uh, and, you know, now we're going we're gonna to have a chat about how we can make sure that that money um, continues to be in, in the forecast and, and can be planned to be uh, um, in, in the 2022 uh, budget, which uh, some of us on the line are probably working on pre-budget submissions. And we did talk about that as well as one, one uh, issue that uh, we're, the court is going to be working on to, to, to get. Um, in, I think it was for August 6th that they're due. So with that, um, we've got CORD's Midsummer Super Panel in Town Hall. Um, and we've got on the line, and I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves uh, properly. Um, but we've got Kathleen Monk with Earns Clip uh, Strategy Group, uh, Jeff Turner with Blue Sky Strategy Group, and Roberta Kremczynski with Strategy Core. Um, with us, so thrilled to have you all here. Our first kickoff question, in addition to giving us just a bit of, of, of your background, you know, uh, what's happening right now is, as you know, the parties are, are prepping, um, you know, nominations happening. What, what, what's happening right now that, 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 you know, the normal citizen, uh, if there's such a thing, uh, people on the line here maybe don't see, but you see. Uh, over to you, why don't we start with Kathleen? Well, it's a busy time and I, I hope you don't see what I see. Uh, I hope that you have more of a life and are seeing more of water and cottages and trees and not uh, kind of uh, eating your popcorn, watching the political antics like I am still stuck in my house, even, even, even though COVID is kind of allowing us to be a bit more free, but it is a very, very busy political time right now for a few things that Bill's mentioned. One, we're all working on those budget submissions. Uh, deadline is uh, T minus, uh, I think we've got 
uh, eight more days to get those in by midnight. Um, and even if there is an election, those budget submissions are going to be really, really important because they will be part of the fiscal cycle and the consultation, which will happen into the fall. But really what we're watching, what political watchers like myself, my colleagues, Roberta and Jeff are watching or how the, how the political parties are pre-positioning themselves, having these pre-election tour test runs, so to speak. Uh, we're looking at the polls, we're looking at the positioning, uh, folks are testing messaging. You're seeing a lot of the leaders in, in some of those battleground ridings. So a lot of folks um, in Ontario and in BC, uh, pretty soon we're gonna see them going into Quebec, which will also be a key battleground um, in this election. A lot of territory being fought over there and even some some new things that are opening up like Alberta um, you know I, I uh, probably Bill wanted us to do a little bit of our background I come from media and politics in the nonprofit sector um, but I also have worked on campaigns across the country for new democratic parties my I started in um, political work with Jack Layton but I've worked for Rachel Notley Andrea Horvath and others across the country and there's a lot of battlegrounds that are opening up in Alberta too so Calgary Edmonton, I wouldn't expect that province to stay as blue as it is going um, coming out of the next election. So I'll leave it to my colleagues, uh, Roberta and Jeff, to maybe touch on what their election best timing is. But one thing I do want to say, don't, don't conclude or don't put your money on for sure that it's going to be a quote unquote fall election, because we could see E-Day happen as early as September 20th, um, maybe even September 13th. Uh, but uh, so uh, definitely um, I'm watching for that writ to drop probably the week of the 16th of August, somewhere in there. That's what all of the pundits and journalists are saying. That said, we all talk to one another. So careful, you know, like it's like this, this circle, you know, <laughs> I whisper something to Roberta, she whispers it to Jeff. And then we all think, oh yeah, the election is going to be called right after the Nova Scotia election. But, but so uh, watch for that. And, you know, my money, um, is really on, uh, and we can, you know, uh, debate about this uh, a little bit more, but um, that it's in the Liberal Party's interest to have a shorter election uh, campaign than a longer one. So the minimum is 36 days. But as you know, from election law, they are allowed to go up to 50 days. Uh, there's that famous election of 2015 that went something like 77, 78 days, right? People still have the battle wounds from that election. I don't think they're going to do that. Um, so I would expect something to be called mid to late August. I would expect the election to happen, the E-Day to happen, people at the polls uh, mid, mid to late September. Um, if it drifts into October, fine, but we're definitely not drifting into 2022. Wow, very exciting. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Uh, Jeff, um, a little bit about you and uh, what, what do you see in terms of the, the parties and, and the party, let's put it that way. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Sir Han. Uh, wonderful to be with this group. I did scroll through the many, many windows, so uh, uh, wonderful to see so many people coming out on that summer day. Um, Jeff Turner, I am a senior consultant with Blue Sky Strategy Group here in Ottawa, uh, working in federal government relations, communications, and, and public affairs. Uh, before uh, Blue Sky, where I've been for almost four years, I was a senior political aide at Queen's Park uh, with a number of ministers there, including working on health, uh, social, and justice files. Uh, with the Minister of Finance, where I uh, had a, um, a key hand in the uh, the previous government's uh, Pharmacare Plus program that we rolled out of the 2017 budget. So know a bit about this space. Um, just to get into the answers here, and, and Kathleen did a great job touching on the the tours. I think we're all starting, we're all seeing those in the news, and that's a huge part of that pre-election period. So I'll zoom in a little bit on the operations side. Um, two things are happening. There's the preparations for the air war and preparations for the ground war. You'll hear people like us talk in those two categories a lot. Uh, air war, as is happening, is TV and, and public messaging, things that people are hopefully seeing. And ground war is how your campaign is working on the ground. And the things as simple as do you have a lease for a commercial building on a main street that starts in a week? Um, that's really what a lot of is happening on the ground um, with political parties right now. In the back on the air war sense, there is that tour, but I'd also point out parties everywhere are now producing their television ads, they're producing their social media ads. Uh, you may have noticed that Justin Trudeau shaved and got a haircut, uh, which uh, from a political tactics point of view means you need all new video footage. 
you need all new photographs. You need all new pictures of him shaking hands that weren't from three or four years ago when he was last looking like that, or two years ago. It feels like three or four for all of us. So that's that stuff that's happening on the preparatory side and on the ground level side, as I said, um, local campaigns are now fully, um, you know, fully getting organized in terms of who the people will be working those campaigns. Uh, with the, the local teams with their particular uh, MP or their particular candidate. As I said, they're locking up, uh, they're locking up uh, campaign space, they're getting things printed, they're getting lawn signs printed. So there's a lot of that happening right now. And uh, uh, just to conclude with the violent agreement that there will be an election in about three weeks from now, um, all of my sources tell me that the government calendar is mysteriously blank after August 15th. So, uh, um, uh, and it won't be before then, but it could be then and voting day as Kathleen said, could be as soon as the 13th of September, more likely in the back end of September, uh, likely a Monday and, uh, and we're about to get going soon. Excellent, thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, Roberta, what, what a bit about you and what are you seeing? Sure, hi, I'm Roberta Kremchinski with uh, a manager with Strategy Corp based in Ottawa. And it's wonderful to be here today. I'm, I'm kind of providing a bit of a conservative perspective, but I'll, I'll maybe just sort of temper that and saying it's a really strong observer stance um, that I'm taking here. But, you know, watching for the election coming up is sort of one of those things that is, is it's absorbing day to day for, for everyone, you know, people like Kathleen and Jeff and myself, uh, we're seeing that all the time. I'd agree with what they've said so far about that sort of readiness for and the preparations underway for the election. I mean, I think it's a, it's a boat that's, you know, it's it's setting sail. We're, we're getting to that point where there's no holding back on that. Um, I would say just sort of from uh, from that perspective of, you know, sort of getting ready, candidates are being nominated, we're really seeing that, that piece kind of coming together. And I think it's just starting to become sort of that, that storm around, uh, not when, but are not if, but when. And I think we're getting really, really close on that front. And like, I don't, there's not much I would add to, to what uh, Kathleen and Jeff have laid out. I spoke to um, spoke someone in Atlantic Canada, uh, just yesterday. And one of the things they said to me is like, we know something's coming because all of the car rental agencies are booked up solid at the end of end of August, beginning of September. And uh, you know what, there are all these things. It takes a lot going into a campaign. You need you need a lot of materials, you need a lot of supplies. There's things that you don't even anticipate that you will need to run a campaign. And all of those pieces are starting to come together. There, there's shortages, there's, they're just unavailable. Um, so I think we're just, you know, we're just sort of counting down those days and getting to that point of seeing, you know, where are we going and what's happening. I think that point about the leaders tour is really important. And particularly in this year, it's one of those first times. And I would say if I focus maybe a bit on the conservative side, this is one of the first times that Aaron O'Toole has been able to get out around Canada and meet voters where they are. Um, his leadership essentially started last year. It was del like the leadership for the conservatives was delayed because of the pandemic last year. It got to August last year. So he's been leader less than a year now heading into a campaign. It's probably the first time he's really been able to get boots on the ground in different parts of the country. And we've seen him going to, he was in BC, spent some time in Alberta, Saskatchewan, but then also out in Atlantic Canada, where in 2019, the conservatives only had one seat. So there's room for that, that vote to grow there. So you sort of see that, see them going to the, especially going to the places where there's that potential to grow the boat. So I think where, you know, I sort of see it as like, we've got probably just count down the days to that mid-August point. Um, I think probably the, the federal election timing, it's looking at Nova Scotia and election day there on August 17th as a bit of a, a guiding point. But yeah, if it's a fall election, it's a very early fall election. So stay tuned. Excellent. Okay. So elections called, um, you know, party platforms are probably going to print pretty soon, you would think. Um, we're, we feel very fortunate uh, in the rare disorders community because it's been, I don't know, when was uh, 2015, that, that was when we launched Canada's rare disease strategy and did that cross Canada tour with the, um, with the Economic Club of Canada. Um, rare has, has, you know, jumped up the political agenda and is achieving a lot of, um, uh, I think, uh, important policy wins at the provincial and the federal level. We talked a little bit about that earlier. But let's start above rare a little bit, health policy. So, and you know, there you've got health policy is a part of social policy, and then you've got national pharmacare as a sort of an umbrella issue. And even Durhan, you, you mentioned the two issues. One was, you know, on rare disease drug strategy, and the other was, you know, uh, a, a prescription drug list for everyone. You know, how does that sort of translate into the campaign? What are the parties going to talk about in terms of health care and health policy? I mean, we're just coming out of a, of a global pandemic. We're maybe still in it in many ways. Um, 
you know, let us know what you think about health and, and COVID and, and what can we expect um, in, in that top line from each of the, uh, each of the parties from your perspectives. Shall I start? Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump in, Bill. Uh, thanks for that. And, um, you know, as, as we all know, and as, as the people on this call know very well, uh, health and our healthcare system is, is perennially uh, the number one issue for Canadians. Uh, it is something that we obviously uh, hold dear, uh, but I think more and more the, the you know, the, the shine of our public healthcare system is, is, is no longer, you know, hiding the fact that there are gaps. Um, uh, yes, it's better than a lot of other places, but yes, it still has gaps. And what COVID has laid bare, not to dwell on it, but also just the fact that we also have, you know, 13 different health systems, basically, uh, that may or may not work well together and are at the direction of their respective governments who control how they operate and, and uh, certainly take, uh, certainly uh, quite happily take uh, funding from the federal government to help that along. So as you look at this, I think just to answer Bill's question, and, and yes, stepping up a little higher than the, than the rare degrees diseases world, um, really when parties are talking to voters, and that's who they're talking to when they're at the campaigns, they're talking to people who they call their voting universe, people who might vote for them or people who will vote for them. Uh, they don't spend a lot of time talking to people who won't vote for them. Um, so you'll see the parties kind of sort themselves into uh, various issues that way. Uh, they'll speak to the people who are likely to vote to them. So, for example, let's just start with pharmacare, of course. It's a, it's a, it's a long-standing issue. As I said, I, I worked on that issue before it was a federal issue uh, in Ontario. And I think I would like to say that we had a bit of a hand in pushing that up the ladder into the national scope from the Ontario level, including with Dr. Hoskins, who ended up doing his work um, in continuing that work in that way. Um, so pharmacare is, is definitely going to be on the agenda. I think it's not a mystery to everybody that it, it's, its prominence in the discussion has ebbed and flowed over the last three or four years. I would observe that during COVID it ebbed because there were other issues. The NDP certainly have continued to put this high on their agenda. In fact, the NDP have said pharmacare isn't good enough. Pharmacare needs to be vision care and dental care and, and other uh, aspects of our healthcare that are uh, either private insurance model or not covered under the healthcare model. So, if anything, the NDP are, gr are growing this this pie and this movement, which you know I would argue may or may not contribute to its ultimate success. Um, the Liberal government has in no way said that they're they're not proceeding with this or that it's it's fallen off the wayside. In fact, the Prime Minister just yesterday in his appearance and and uh, event with the uh, the Premier of Newfoundland uh, specifically repeated the commitment uh, and the work that is actually happening at the provincial federal level to to implement what is of course a fairly gradual and fairly um, systemic plan, right? How do we get provinces and the federal government to agree on something so that we can move forward in provinces like childcare that are willing? And there are provinces that won't be willing, and that's a challenge for the federal government, of course, to get this over the headline. So pharmacare will continue to be there. I, I don't think it'll be as prominent as it has been in the past because there is so much else happening with COVID and economic recovery that um, that's a piece of that. But it is a piece of, like childcare, it's a piece of that economic recovery by helping those who don't have access to employer-sponsored drug plans or access to provincial formularies, um, rare diseases that don't uh, often get covered by either of those systems. So I think there is an attention to, to those, uh, those needs uh, as an economic issue and an inclusion issue um, in the same way that when we did children and youth pharmacare, a big idea here was people under 24 often don't have workplace benefits, um, but they've also aged out of their parents' benefits or they are no longer in school. And so what happens if a 24-year-old is on a, a mental health prescription regime and they have to choose by paying for that or not. That's an economic issue as much as it's a, a, an equity and a health issue. Just quickly to touch on it, um, and I think as Bill uh, intoned, the Liberals have their budget from this past spring. The budget basically will be the platform. There will be a couple of other big things that they either grow from that budget or that they have held back to put into the election platform as a, a big shiny object to kind of drive narratives. But really, if you look at what was in that 2021 budget, you will probably see most of the liberal platform there. And just quickly to nail it off, I talked about pharmacare quite a bit, but um, I would just put the other issue that is front and center for most, um, most voters uh, uh, across Canada is the backlog in the healthcare system now as a result of the COVID overwhelming uh, many of our hospital systems. So I think there's $4 billion for that in the last budget. I think that will be something that speaks to voters directly. 
I know from personal experience, I'm sure many of you do too, uh, there are appointments that took a year when they should have taken three months. And uh, that is, that needs to be addressed and I think is a big, a big um, you know, thing that you can put to voters. And of course, long-term care, I won't dwell on it. There's 3 billion in there. We know that this has been a big issue. Uh, the, the federal government said they want to do something about, um, about improving that. They put 3 billion on the table for that. And uh, so I think that'll be the other health uh, aspect there. Um, and oh, sorry, one last thing for this group, of course, there is a clinical trials fund for $250 million in the last budget that will go to Kaihai uh, to support clinical trial funding. I'm not familiar with the details, whether that is uh, of great promise to this group or not, but I would point out it's in there and it's actually listed in the kind of pre-platform listing that some media organizations are putting out there uh, on the Liberals' behalf about things that they're committing to. And thanks, Jeff. Research is very important. And I mean, you'll see Durhan nodding her head and saying research centers of excellence. And and gosh, Durhan, you've been involved in that. So so that's something certainly to um, to cheer and to look forward to. Uh, so Kathleen, what can we expect from from the Orange Team Orange um, as as things get moving? Yeah, um, a couple things. I think uh, just to joke a little bit, Bill, you've been out of politics too long if you think the platforms are all sewed up now, because, uh, <laughs> or particularly when you Democrats, people are writing those things literally as they're being printed and run to the, the platform uh, uh, media press conference, or at least that has been uh, my experience. And I know that there's stuff that always be wedged into platforms. Um, certainly I have clients doing that now, doing that hard lobby that this would be a good nugget for you to put into your platform. So, so there's still, um, to give a bit of optimism, to the group. There's always room for more, especially when uh, people aren't sure of their majority and feel like they may need to uh, may need to be more flexible on some of those policy points. So um, I think that we are in a unique position as Jeff's, you know, clearly outlined, you know, coming out of the pandemic, the focus on health, which has always been Canadians number one priority, but just seeing the havoc that's been wreaked in our in our healthcare system, obviously overcrowded hospitals and hallway medicine, which has been happening for so long, but also access to, to medicines and vaccines and just the whole focus and clearly the long-term care crisis and the fact that we've just had an overwhelming number um, of deaths in our long-term care homes um, will be an emotional issue that will play strongly throughout uh, this election campaign. I mean, that is the battle that, so to take it to a 30,000 feet political perspective, keeping the focus on health though, that, that is the battle that parties will be trying to fight is who can frame up the election and the ballot box question. Will it be framed on COVID management and steering the country through this, you know, once in a generation, once in a century like crisis of this pandemic? Or can, will the conservatives potentially be successful in dragging the framing over to more of an economic framing where they will have uh, more strength um, and say, potentially, we need to worry about the affordability crisis, we need to be concerned with inflation, uh, pocketbook issues, which also then health and uh, drugs obviously you know, dovetail into, right? So there's potential, I think, for this stakeholder group. Um, I think there's lots of potential for you actually to be speaking to each party. I mean, New Democrats, um, you have us generally, you know, we, 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 we are, you know, supportive of more investments overall in, in healthcare and, and, and attention to uh, some of the issues that Jeff's already outlined. But I think that there's an opportunity for this stakeholder group to actually speak to all parties and ensure that they strongly embrace um, your policy asks. And you're, you benefit, um, frankly, if I could be bold, um, and speaking from my communication and campaign lens kind of background, you benefit from having very strong narratives, right? Very strong narratives that work on the doorstep, that are relatable, um, and people can understand. And while there is always that that the the issue of burden, uh, which I, I think Durhan referenced in terms of the what we heard report, um, it is you know you can balance that off with the relatability of the narratives that your group speaks to. Um, uh, just to take a little, go down a rabbit hole for a second. Um, when I do media training for CEOs or clients, one of the examples I always remind them of is everybody remembers the $16 Bev Oda orange juice. Even if you're not in politics like I am, if you're not a hardened, cynical person like Roberta or Jeff that we've been steeped in this stuff all the time, we remember that why? Because we remember that the $16 is an outrageous amount of money to spend on a glass of orange juice when you could buy six cans of concentrate and make it with water at home. And so it's why... It's 
it's a narrative, it's something visual people can understand. And I, I give you that little tangent because you also with the rare disease community have those narratives that you can explain and tell the story of the impact on people's lives and on communities, right? And that and that speaks volumes that you will sear those narratives into folks' hands. And that's where you've got a, um, you know, a leg up, so to speak, in terms of your policy ask. But I'll, but I'll leave it there. But I do think health is going to dominate. I'm running a few pre-electoral campaigns right now in advance of the writ, and they are 100% focused uh, our advertisement and our broadcast on on the health focus and um, what we need in terms of investments into um, our our health sector. So I think it's going to be a prominent issue. Thanks so much, Kathleen. I remember there was some chewing gum that was entitled also, yes. in title months. Uh, <laughs> Thank you know, there's, yeah, and R Roberta, um, health uh, with with the blue team. <laughs> you know. Where is O'Toole going to retool Canada's health system to start using some of the uh, the puns with the leaders' names? Well, it's a good start there. Uh, if you're going to use puns, that's a good one. I think you know, as as both Kathleen and Jeff talked about, health is such an important part of the economy now. I think the pandemic really made that evident that you know we need a healthy economy in order to have have a functioning economy. And I think part of that framing for, for O'Toole will be looking at it from that economic lens and saying, okay, where, where are we making the right investments and how are we looking at that in that, that bigger picture of the economy? Um, I think sort of that early indication of where, where the thinking is for the Conservatives is, is really from the Canada Recovery Plan that came out from them a couple of weeks ago, month, last month, June. I'm losing track of time already. Um, but it has a lot of those pillars. You sort of see some really traditionally strong conservative themes in there in terms of jobs and accountability and economy and looking to, you know, what's the plan to balance the budget and, and prevent, you know, really thinking about things like preventing structural deficits, getting to that economic growth. So there's some very strong, I would say, sort of traditional conservative themes that are coming through with that. But complementary to that, there's already, I think, some parts in that where O'Toole is trying to start to, I think, differentiate himself from conservative leaders of the past. And there's a huge component in that plan looking at mental health. Um, I think it's a really prominent pillar. And it, it is focused, I think, particularly on those areas that kind of fall into federal jurisdiction where they can have, I think, that commitment to action and actually see it through should they be be elected. Um, so there, there's certain elements there. I think part of what what will be, a, I think, is part of that challenge for the Conservatives is to really, really fight, uh, you know, fight the Liberals, fight the NDP, who will look, you know, sort of draw that comparison to Harper. Harper, you're saying that there were cuts in those years, um, and that Aaron will do the same thing. Um, so that's, I think, that's part of the the positioning that's going to help to draw out where that, uh, where the Conservative perspective is going to go on health in the campaign. Um, I think there's some some initial additional initial sort of indications of some I think some changes in terms of how the conservatives would look at um, essentially their approach to emergency preparedness and, and using that as a bit of a, a positioning as well too. Um, I think the fulfilling that role of the opposition through through the pandemic has really I think sort of cemented that a big part of how they how the conservatives are going to go to voters is also to say here is our plan for future pandemics and here's what it will include. I think there's some really important elements within there that really start to change that narrative, particularly around how the government looks to looks to the biopharmaceutical industry, but also just how it how it um, like how it prepares for pandemics in order to prevent the type of economic um, disruption that we saw over the last, you know, 18, 20, 24 months now. Um, so I think really trying to think through how is that, how, how is that response to public health preparing for, for pandemics, um, things like that, how can we do that without having to go through that same level of economic um, hardship that we've gone through and the level of spending that we've had in the last little while. So I think that's going to be part of that uh, that conversation and that framing for the conservative team. But I'll go back to initially Kathleen's very first point, which was uh, platforms still, you know, there's the ink is not dry on them yet. So, you know, there's maybe not a huge window of opportunity remaining, but there's still some time to shape that. So I think particularly from, um, from the, you know, sort of the blue team perspective, uh, I think there's, you know, there's, there's maybe a little bit of, of room yet. But there's also going to be more to come, I think, from from the conservatives on the health front uh, as the campaign actually gets underway and unfolds. That's a that's a I want to pick up on something. And uh, it's a great point. Now, with everything digital, things can be inserted and change and, and modified. Um, one of the things I noticed in uh, the conservatives 
uh, and they're and they're secure the you know the future of Canada. Uh, you know the, the security is um, is a big issue, and in that pandemic preparedness plan, they said we will stop fighting with the pharmaceutical industry. And that that seemed to be code for you know we will do something about the PMPRB issue that has caused such a rift with the with the sector. Um, and I would put this out to the other other you know panelists. Um, you know, what can we do to, to draw on uh, the COVID experience to say, you know what, there's, there's maybe a better way to relate to a sector that we kind of need uh, in order to, um, you know, save ourselves from, from both COVID, but also from so many other things uh, that vulnerable Canadians want, uh, have been dealing with. It's funny, really early in the pandemic, and Duran, you can attest to this too, the cystic fibrosis community was saying, look, we're very used to having to be away from other people because we're so vulnerable to infections already. Now, all Canadians are experiencing what we've experienced most of our lives. And I thought that that, and, and Durhan, you picked up on that for, for rare disease patients almost in, in general. Are there any learnings from, from, from those two things in terms of stop fighting with the pharmaceutical industry and, and help the most vulnerable and really listen to them as opposed to just move forward with some very controversial proposals. Am I, am I getting that right, Durhan, or do you want to jump in here? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, let me rephrase it ever so slightly. It isn't so much stop fighting with the pharmaceutical industry, but really I think what we've seen coming out of COVID is that in order for us to actually be both health and economically viable, we need to have strong partnerships between the public and the private sector. And where we've seen, you know, really, you know, great advances made is where that's happening. And as you say, COVID taught that, you know, has really brought that front and center. And if we haven't learned that, then you know, I think shame on us. But I think beyond that, this is what we've been saying all along in the rare disease community. We can't just do it in the public sector. We can't just do it in the private sector. But good God, when the public and the private sector are not working hand in hand, it's the patients who actually suffer. So I would really like to put it out there. So let's not stop fighting. How do you build collaborative partnerships? You know, Bill always wants to kind of avoid the falling off the cliff. And I'm always saying like, no, let's find another pathway. You know, forget the cliff. You know, where's the other pathway here? Yeah, I, can I just jump in on that and, and and pointing out a comment in the chat by Judith, which is which is very smart, which is it is looking at, and I think the government has had a bit of an aha moment through the pandemic that in fact, medications and investments in, in developing those and research and development is actually an investment in Canadians' health and also in the economy, as Judith says. But I would, I would also phrase it another way. Um, what we've seen is... Uh, the research and development and biotech community and that innovation that's happening there is pandemic resilient and in fact economic strengthening so um, it's a it can mm -hmm. operate during a pandemic like that research can continue that research is helping in preventing pandemics uh, as, a, as a second point and it also is helpful to strengthen and, and strengthen our economy and is economy boosting like you look at the government of Quebec right now and they're they're like this is where we should be investing same thing in BC that that money is is really pouring into that because they realize we can have this talent attraction uh, component we can have uh, investments we can uh, we, we still need to work on some things in Canada for sure like we need to attract more CEOs more c-suite advisors who can run those those companies. Um, disclosure here, for many, many years, I've worked for an organization called Edmare, uh, formerly uh, known as CDRD, the Center for Research and Drug Development, um, which, you know, basically does a training program to not only get move biotechs and lab operatives to kind of help them understand how to incubate and grow the business side of their research, but also conversely to get CEOs and attract those CEOs and those, you know, business uh, C-suite level operators to understand the life sciences community because it's a really important thing. So I think I think the awakening here um, is that is that we see what a rich area this is to invest, and maybe the government has to be less. Um, almost they saw the pharmaceutical industry and research and development as kryptonite. Like if they came near it, they'd get, you know, they'd get weaker or something. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I think they're just realizing that there's smart investments there. And, you know, I don't work as much as potentially my colleagues, uh, Jeff and and we're Bird to do in this space, but and certainly Bill, who who's uh, an expert known about town. But I know that I said, um, sorry, the 
the economic and development uh, industry, economic and development department is just growing by leaps and bounds, right? Like that is where that that department is growing ferociously. Their hiring is massive, and because that 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 is really Francois um, Philippe Champagne is is really a leading a lot of um, the government's drive on this. Sorry, and I'll end it there. That was a long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that was great, uh, Roberta. Jeff, feel free to jump in. Thank you. Well, I think you know, I think there's a real takeaway, um, particularly in that you know, I think what Kathleen said about that sector. Uh, being pandemic proof. And I think it's also one of those that's pandemic resilient. It's essentially, it's like a pandemic vaccine for the economy, right? It gives us that chance to have that research and innovation. It is such a big part of, I think, the economic engine that is Canada. And it is sort of that, I think it's a real industry for the future. There's room to grow. We have strengths there. We should continue to see them. I think if I maybe sort of put that political hat back on, I think from, you know, perhaps from a, a bit of that sort of takeaway, but there's also room to do things a lot differently. And I think particularly from the conservative sort of approach and what they've outlined in terms of thinking, particularly around that security, um, you know, security and being resilient to threats and, and, you know, preventing pandemics, these types of things. I think they're seeing room to do things differently. Um, I think particularly from a conservative standpoint, look at just simply looking at the language in, in their document related to the pharma industry is incredibly different using terms of ending hostility. Like that's some pretty strong language to describe that relationship between industry and government. So to me, I think there's there, there's a real emphasis there on changing that relationship. Um, you know, and to me, that's a great, that's a great sentiment. I think to me, it matters. How does the rubber hit the road on that? What does that really mean? Because it's, it's always that sort of, I think the typical challenge of any electoral province is a promise is how to translate that into governing because ele elections are one item governing is another one and that's talking about what is a pretty significant change in terms of um, that relationship I think both between the political level of government but also um, the bureaucratic levels of government and the the departments and agencies that are involved in that um, and again like it comes down to how does that then play into the mandate for you know post-election and where does it fall in terms of priority and the resources directed to it and this is i think this is an interesting area where i could see a lot of potential investment from you know potentially from conservatives there's yeah, i mean this this plan right now as we know it is directional um, it may may depend more on how much is actually invested where is it invested how is it different from what uh, what the liberals have been doing but there's there's been a lot of i think attention made to, paid to the sector and to this sort of particular issue around, you know, sort of our capacity in biopharma and, and, and also as well within uh, medical devices and having, you know, the supplies for PPE, being able to have that domestic, um, domestic capacity that we can depend on in times of threat. Um, so I think just being, you know, really there's a bit of a lens that I can anticipate in terms of being looking at how do we ensure that, uh, that sort of resiliency for the future and being able to depend on that from within our, our own borders uh, as well too. So I think there's there's a lot to take away going forward. And you know, to me, there's there's gonna be what we talk about in, in the campaign coming up and then seeing, you know, once we get post-election, how does that actually get implemented and ensure that we maintain that, that, um, that momentum going ahead? Yeah, and actually that's a good segue. Um, instead of going one, two, three, why don't, you know, what happens post-election? Because that was our sort of, sort of wrap-up question. Because I th I, we are going a bit over time on this and we want to open it up to other, other delegates. And, and again, our panel is welcome to stick around and, and, and participate. But let's say we, we get through the, you know, call it um, 36 days, you know, late September. What happens then? We've got these political promises. And if we do our job right, and in fact, if the politicians do their job right and listen to citizens that they want to vote for them, you know, there's gonna be some things like in 2019 where the liberals, they recommit the 500 million. The conservatives commit the 500 million and say they, they spend it a bit differently. They send it to the provinces, but at least it's going to rare. Um, you know, what I'm hearing is that the investments in healthcare are being now considered as an investment not just as an expense. And that's huge. How do we take this momentum post-election to really implement it? Because it's a very um, big challenge. Uh, and we'd love to get your, your thoughts on that. Um, the election's over. What happens in the following three or four weeks? I don't know, Jeff, do you want to start? 
Well, I want to sorry, I had a few notes for our last round and I'll see if I can weave them in, but I um, how, just I want to answer your question. Like the weeks after an election are both um, frustratingly slow and, and incredibly, you know, whiplash inducing when they do speed up. So in the weeks following an election, you're going to have a cabinet appointed that's going to take several weeks. Uh, you're going to have after that, then you have, you know, even if it is the same government coming back, you do have a quite a churn in the various uh, in the various political staff and chiefs of staff, ministers themselves, parliamentary secretaries, yada, yada. Uh, you do have some changes in the public service that often accompany that kind of timeline as well, because deputy ministers will be moved by the prime minister, and then that'll cause all kinds of shuffles underneath them. So there is a lot of change in kind of the six or eight weeks that follow any general election, even if the House resumes and we get into a throne speech and all that. In terms of practical advice, um, number one, I think we already touched on it during the election campaign, telling your story directly to either as a family, as a group locally, as, a, as one of the associations that make up uh, your large organization here. However you can or have the ability to do it, talking with your local candidates and not necessarily making demands of them or asking them to make, you know, sign a pledge that we all take a photo. That's, if they're willing to do that, that's great. That's a good way of holding them to it after. But really just getting them to understand the, the personal situation and, and, and the unfairness that you've probably experienced in your entire uh, medical journeys um, is important for them because they're people people. They want to know what they're what the people sitting across from they're talking to care about and what they've how the government has impacted them or treated them. And that's your best opportunity to have that really um, kind of personal level conversation with a candidate, um, either at your doorstep or in their campaign office or virtually however it ends up going. After the election during that crazy period, um, I think uh, through your organization and, and your, your reps, um, ensuring that your messages are being put into the civil service, both during and immediately following the election, any campaign commitments from the party who ultimately won, and you have the ability to include those into the public service are good. The reason why they're producing briefing binders and they're telling the new minister who just showed up, here are the 10 things that you need to do minister in the next three weeks. And you'd like one of your things to be one of the 10 things, or at least for them to have been briefed on it. Uh, they probably will given the size of some of these issues, but the more that you put into the bureaucratic system during and immediately following election, the more that ends up in front of a minister or a, a you know a 28 year old political staffer on their first day on the job. So that's a really important step that you can take uh, both immediately. Um, the last thing I'll say because it came from my notes from our last the last round of discussion, you know there is the rare uh, diseases drug strategy, the billion dollars. I know it's a bit stale. The good news, and I'm putting my former finance person hat on, the money's allocated. You have that money now allocated in the fiscal architecture of the budget. That's really good because it means it's not just a promise, it's actually built into the fiscal plan. And so reminding as you come through the election and continue to correspond with the government and meet with ministers, reminding them that that money is allocated and that money is 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 promised is, is good and that helps you not fall off. Um, just quickly though, I wanna just on the liberal front before I turn it over probably for the last time, from a liberal perspective, I think one of the things, and I mentioned it quickly, but I want to revisit it, inclusion and, and, and social issues are, of course, very important to the, to the liberals. We're going to hear a lot about, obviously, racial equity, gender equity, um, and but beyond that, of course, is people with disabilities, people who, who may have, um, obviously, conditions that uh, affect their 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 um, you know their ability to navigate the built world and the social world that we live in. Liberals are really attentive to this now, again, as an economic issue. And so I think continuing to, to, to speak of this as an inclusive issue and make sure that your loved ones and the people that you represent to government are not just being taken care of by a healthcare system to make sure that their health needs are being met, but actually that they're being enabled to be a full participant in their community. They may be able to be a full participant in the workforce or a participant in the workforce that, that is comfortable and, and able for them to do, uh, or just simply be more active and plugged into their community, um, notwithstanding the COVID situation and the isolation we're all feeling. Um, having full participants in the society is important to liberals because it's an economic issue as well as a social issue. And so I'll touch on that. Last thing I'll say though, just on the, uh, just from the last conversation from the liberal perspective, um, yes, I mean, there's been a track record with pharma. Uh, I think that applies to most parties, wherever the conservative liberal dividing line is. Everybody on that side, the liberal orange side are typically a bit not friends of the pharma industry and, and the conservatives have said that they, I think it aligns with their red tape and their open for business kind of mindset. Um, but you know, really innovation for the liberals is where this is going to play. The biotech sector, the sort of uh, research oriented jobs, um, you know, uh, uh, STEM jobs are big, you know, having the educational pathways to get people there. And as, as Kathleen quite appropriately mentioned, the industry ministry is 
absolutely awash with cash and is looking for places to sort of to, to, to gas the, to, to step on the gas for this, um, for this sort of 21st century economy. They're trying very hard to build to kind of carry us over the hump from other older economies that, that, that are fading away or are, are you know, no longer responsible for the sort of vast majority of jobs in our country. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, final words to uh, Roberta or Kathleen. And Kathleen, I, I'm just a lot is happening in BC. I think Admari is sort of half based there and half in Montreal, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. it just seems like that's a pretty orange province. It's a very orange province right now. There's a lot of activity there. Like, do you think the, the NDP um, are starting to be more sensitive to the value of the biotech? Oh, for sure. And and you're seeing the, the support and the cheerleading from that Horgan government, for sure. And the ministers, they are very supportive of, of, uh, of the innovation that's happening both in, in biotech life sciences, also in the digital space. Like there's lots of, um, BC is a great place to be right now. Um, but just to wrap it up, I'm conscious of your time. I would say seven, seven words, one sentence in terms of what the work that this stakeholder group needs to do, which is don't let your foot off the gas you know, don't let your foot off the gas. Like you need to be thinking short-term and long-term. So divide up your group, however you do. Some of you focus on the election and getting in there on platform, on door knocking, on making sure your story's out. The rest of you focus on what's the plan for when they come back? What's the plan for committee? How do we get in front of uh, finance committee when they come back and they start redoing all of those uh, budget consultations? How do we get into the fiscal cycle in terms of budget 2022? Um, you just need all the briefing that Jeff has already uh advise you to do in terms of getting into the the public servants and, and the civil, um, the, those folks to make sure they're briefing up. Um, you, you, you need to do it because I worry otherwise, and this is where the big hammer comes or the big stick is that I worry otherwise that the report that what we heard from Canadians just ends up collecting dust. So it's incumbent upon you. It's incumbent upon your, you know, sweat equity over the next few months to ensure that you have great counsel and bill and in others to to kind of push this issue mm -hmm. to the forefront and and make sure you're in those places where they're still um, understanding that this is an issue and an area of um, policy importance for all Canadians. I mean, thanks so much, mm -hmm. Kathleen. And you couldn't find a more committed and determined group, I don't think. And, and I've seen some people on, on the chat group, but, but the fact that we've got so many people out on a summer webinar <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> to, you know, next time we're going to have to like divide, like, you know, do the breakout groups on, on Zoom. But la last word to you, uh, Roberta, um, and any thoughts on, on what next? You've been around the rare disease community a long time. Are you mm -hmm. seeing some, some really good stuff? Like, what do, what do you think in terms of where we can go next? Well, I, I think the point that the rare disease community at is right now is so exciting. There has just been so much that's happened in the last little while. I see that momentum building and I really like my goal is to see that continue to build. And I think Jeff and Kathleen really talked to those next steps really clearly. I think it's keep making those contacts. Uh, the election campaign kind of gives that opportunity to really make those contacts, tell the story, tell, you know, tell it authentically and genuinely and why it matters to you as a voter. And that, that starts to really plant that seed. And hopefully if that person gets elected, they take that into their office on Parliament Hill and it can continue to build from there. But really it's continuing to keep at that message. It's something that I know durhan has been doing for years and years, um, but it just needs to continue to continue right now. Um, so this is, you know, this is certainly don't take your foot off the gas, keep going, keep making that message loud. I think we're seeing even already, um, I think those early foundational steps where it's going to be very hard, like it's going to be impossible for, for any party to ignore that health role right now. And I think particularly seeing how, how much attention there's been from a political perspective and look at all the things that happened on Parliament Hill over the last several months where PMPRB has become a big issue. There's, there's more recognition and awareness of some of those, those issues now than I've, I've seen in, in years. So I think it's just the time to keep that momentum up, make as many contacts as possible, really use this as an opportunity to spread that awareness so that when we do get into that step later this fall of, all right, what is the 44th parliament going to do? They see this as at the top of that list of, of things to do. I feel like we're like at a pre-election rally for rare. So I remember when we were in, yeah, I know, you know what, in Vancouver, I actually started a chant and you can hear it on CBC or whatever after like a big walk up Berard, and it was Canada for rare. And it's a pretty clunky chant. So 
you know, if anyone else can think of others, but I actually do feel like the, the whole community is, um, is now really pumped and excited and um, yeah, let's, Durhan, take us home. We, yeah, let's, well, let me say, first of all, could not thank Kathleen, Roberta and Jeff enough for coming on and taking the entire time with us. We know we said you come in and be out in 30 minutes and you know, to your credit, you hung in there and continued to give us, I think, such amazing words. And um, really, I think as uh, Bill said, uh, when we were doing this, you go way back a couple of elections and people were going like, what is rare, you know? And nobody asks that anymore. I mean, we still are trying to define what is rare, but I think it's a big difference in terms of, I think the other thing we want to make sure, and Roberta, those are important words, don't take your, you know, your foot off the gas. I think what we all recognize in the rare disease community, nobody gave this to us. This was not a gift. This wasn't something that somebody said, oh, surprise, you know, you guys are so deserving. Let me give you, you know, rare disease drug strategy. Let me give you a billion dollars. Well, it was kind of a gift in terms of a billion dollars, but you know what I mean? We worked for it and we will have to continue to work for it. But even more importantly, we can't squander it. We cannot, you know, take the full advantage. I love what everybody was saying around investment, because that's the word we've been saying all along. Don't think about it as expenditure. Let's think about it. But investment also means we need to be part of that research and development, bring in new medicines and creating that investment opportunity. So Kathleen, you know, really excited by, you know, kind of how you painted that big picture, because that's where we all need to be, right? And, and quite frankly, I'm surprised, because we would expect it that Roberta and the conservatives are going to be there, and they've got that big kind of industrial platform for us. And we know that, you know, Jeff, you guys have been in our corner in terms of making sure that we've got this equal access, but I love the way you positioned it, you know, because it is where we all need to be. So I think it, you know, I mean, the other thing to say very clearly is we've been saying all along, a rare disease drug strategy, One number one, it's not just a drug strategy. It's got to be a disease strategy, a rare disease strategy. And if we're going to take $500 million a year and we're just going to pay for drugs with it, let's just go home because it's never going to work, right? We'll just be spending the money. We need to invest it. And we need to invest it in the infrastructure and in diagnosis and in the terms of excellence, in terms of research, in terms of monitoring these drugs. And we can do that. The other thing I'm very excited about, and I know because we sit in the international community, Canada has an opportunity to be an international leader in terms of rare diseases, in terms of rare disease research, in terms of, I mean, nice thing about innovation, right? We don't have to build gigantic incubators, you know? We don't have to invest, you know, gazillions of dollars in order to develop drugs for rare diseases, and especially with some of the kind of very highly specialized therapies where we've got expertise already. So we could, in fact, be that leader. But the other thing that I'm saying with this rare disease drug strategy is that it's a strategy that's a blueprint for all of our access to medicines. These are where the new medicines are coming. And the question was asked, what's rare? And the answer is there isn't any, because many, many diseases are going to become rare diseases. And these diseases are going to have the same kind of challenges that we have when we think of very specifically, genomically, precisely defined, you know, subsets of much more major diseases, right? Parkinson's is going to be a whole nest of, of rare diseases. Even Alzheimer's and others are going to become much more specifically designed, especially cancers. We need to have a strategy that's going to say, how are we going to address these? And it's not going to be, you know, the same way as we've been doing before. We've got to be able to do it smartly. So I think all of these things are really very exciting. So a rare disease drug strategy, a rare disease strategy isn't just for rare diseases. I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to work, I think, for everybody. And I think that's the very important thing of it. So it's a big tent. So if we think about $500 million being spread to pay for drugs, yeah, everybody's going to be fighting over it. That's not the answer. $500 million a year is an investment. And it can actually, if we invest it, it actually can work for everybody. So I think that's so exciting to hear all of you saying that. This is amazing. I mean, quite frankly, I will say to each one of you, you were running for office, I would vote for you. So if, you, know, you can step up to that position because that is exactly what we need to be working with. So huge thanks to all of you. Um, Bill, I know we're going to be talking about some of the uh, webinars we're going to be doing, unfortunately, into the summer as we're going along. Um, and maybe we'll kind of outline a few of those topics that we're going to be doing. And we don't expect that, you know, everybody's going to give up their summer holidays. But hey, you know what? It's an hour, an hour and a half out of a whole week or every other week that, you know, we're asking you to, you know, crawl out of the sand. And, or if you're going to take your computer out into the sand, find a good Wi-Fi spot that you can sit in front of and, and engage with it. So, Bill, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks. And just um, once again, thank you, Kathleen, Roberta, Jeff. That was, you were fantastic. We never know how these things are going to turn out, but when we have such, you know, thoughtful 
experienced people as you, then, you know, you just know we're going to end up in a good place. Um, and you have, you know, rallied the, the whole rare disease community to get ready for, for what's coming. So just, we can't thank you enough. Um, in a few weeks, we've got by. In a thank few you weeks. very much. <laughs> oh, yeah, Roberta, any, you know, you can jump in and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about next webinars. We're good? Oh, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, thank bye. you. Yeah, and thanks, Bill. Thanks, uh, Durhan. Wonderful. And uh, thank you to all of you, again, a lot of you who have joined us today. Thanks. Yeah. And so we're going to do another couple more nitty gritty webinars, uh, you know, in a little while to, to align on what's happening with, with PMPRB in a few weeks. If you've missed um, these last two mini webinar series, you can catch up on, uh, on Cord's uh, YouTube or, and SlideShare channels and, and, the, and the URLs are there. Um, and, you know, just keep in touch with, with everything that, uh, that, that, that Cord is doing. I think there's, there's maybe, you know, a couple things we need to, we need to drill into uh, later this summer, and that's definitely what the PMPRB changes entail and mean, and that'll help inform Cord's uh, submission that will be coming in towards the end of August. And um, what we're bringing out of this discussion is, um, and I think Kathleen started on it, was we've got this, this you know, very extensive laundry list of ingredients that was the what we heard report from Health Canada. How do we turn that into the recipe that, that can be picked up um, by the campaigns, by the senior civil servants to actually implement it? So that's a big challenge, but keep your foot on the, I'm, I'm seven words, foot theater on the gas. Thank you so much. We'll see you in a few weeks. Take care. And just remind, yeah. and just remind everybody, we will be rolling out a toolkit. I mean, and I think, you know, what Roberta and Kathleen and Jeff are telling us is we need everybody to go out there and do the street work because, yep. that's, you know, get in front of, you know, those, you know, you know, those candidates and make sure they understand you're the only ones, you know, that are going to be able to tell that personal story. And we need that. So uh, stay tuned. A lot more to happen, unfortunately. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Take care.